understand it. Deutsche Volksgenossinnen und Volksgenossinnen. I mean, he had the power in his speeches to move the masses. As he listens to BBC, he is immediately convinced that they are telling the truth. My friend Helmut thought that was his Christian obligation to warn the people. And then he opened the door and there comes my friend Rudy. And I said, Rudy, what are you doing here? He is the third in our group. I said, what do you mean the third? Who is the second? And Helmut typed on it, Hitler the murderer, Hitler is the guilty one. The first thing we see is that he's emerged from some kind of a process as a full-blown anti-Nazi. He puts the prefix V-E-R on the front of the word Führer, which means that Hitler is now the seducer of the people. I opened the door and there stood two guys with that long dark leather coat and he lifted up his lapel from the coat and there was the badge, Geheime Staatspolizei, Gestapo. The Nazis, they don't want you to know the truth. The truth was deadly. Hey everyone. Welcome to another live stream for Truth and Conviction, the series. Um, I am Matt Whitaker, uh, the creator and director of Truth and Conviction, and Glad you're with us. I know that we've got a whole bunch of uh, Truth and Conviction fans who are tuning in, as well as a whole bunch of Angel Studios fans who are who are who've been tuning in faithfully. I also know that we have a whole group uh, of other individuals who may be wondering why this live stream is in your feed. Uh, I'll ask you, please hang with me for just a few minutes, and then it will make perfect sense. We've got a huge announcement uh, that we're going to make in just uh, in just a few minutes and so welcome to all new uh, new viewers or all of you who are new who are tuning in for the first time um, if you are wondering wait a minute what is this all about what is truth and conviction here's the uh, the elevator pitch this is a true this is a series a four-part limited series that we're preparing to make uh, about a true story based in Nazi Germany about a 16 year old kid who ran an, uh, a, a resistance group, freedom fighters in Nazi Germany, made up of him and his friends who were all teenagers. And he was the mastermind. He would write these anti-Hitler leaflets and flyers, and then he would hand them out to his friends, and then he and his friends would go out on the night, at night on the streets of Hamburg and, uh, and put up these, these flyers. So it's an incredible story, and um, we're going to talk more about that tonight. So again, grateful to have everybody here. October uh, already has been a big month for Truth and Conviction. There's a lot going on and there's a lot that's still coming. Uh, I mentioned in the live stream last week that we were going to be, uh, that Glenn Beck had invited us to, to come down and be on his show. And so uh, yesterday, actually the day before, we flew down to Dallas and, uh, and met with him, and then yesterday he had me on his live radio show, and uh, you know what, it was actually really cool. It was fun. Yeah, I, I make no, no secret of the fact that he and I don't uh, align very well politically. Uh, we see things differently, but uh, he and I both love freedom and liberty, and he loves the story of Helmut Hubner, and so he was very gracious and uh, it was actually a really cool experience to, to be down there and to be on a show and to be able to talk to um, his listeners. You know, obviously he's got a, a large, I'll bet I'm sure that some of you listening and tuning in tonight um, listen to him and maybe you got to hear that. For me, the coolest part of it, yeah, this probably was the coolest part, is uh, I had brought with me some uh, replicas of Helmut's flyers and leaflets and um, and I had them with me when we were there in the studio, actually recording it. And and he he asked, he said, "Hey, can you hand me one of those?" And so I just handed him the one that I had in my in my hand at the time, and he got it. And he there on the radio started reading Helmut's words, and it gives me chills now just to think about it. But 80 years after Helmut typed up these anti-Hitler uh, flyers and leaflets. Um, a radio host who has millions of followers and listeners was reading his words um, on the radio to America. And uh, that was just a, a, 
very powerful and uh, and cool experience. And I'm we will have uh, for those who are interested, um, we'll let you know soon of ways that if you missed that or, or didn't know about it, that you can you can catch that and tune in uh, to his podcast, uh, which he he edited down the live radio show. So you can you can tune into that, and we'll make sure you know where to find that. Um, as I also announced last week, this month, of course, is the 80th anniversary of, of the execution of Helmut Hubner, of this 16-year-old boy. Um, and uh, he was executed in Berlin. And the place of his execution, uh, there you see it, he was, he was, uh, was guillotine. He was beheaded by guillotine, which is just tragic um, and kind of unbelievable, really. But now that site is a memorial. Um, it's a national memorial, and on the 27th of October, the German government is hosting a, um, a memorial service uh, in, in memory of Helmut and what he did as the youngest resistance fighter in Nazi Germany to be convicted uh, and sentenced to death for his efforts to get the truth out. And so we will be going over there. Um, and we'll have some cameras with us. And so we'll be covering that event that whole week. Um, we'll be up in Hamburg where he lived, where he grew up and where he operated. We'll be there and, um, and doing social posts and, and even a, a live stream from up there. And on the day of the, on the 27th, the day of the memorial and the day that he was executed 80 years ago, uh, we'll actually be doing a live stream from Berlin, uh, from a spot not far away from, from the actual site where he was executed. Um, and so I invite everybody to, to be ready for that and, and tune in to that. Put that on your calendars, October 27th. Um, and, but of course, we'll be giving you plenty of warnings between uh, now and then. Um, I would invite you, if you're new, if you're not new, um, Make some comments in the below there, just in the comment section. Uh, tell me your name. Tell me where you're from. Um, tell me some interesting little detail about yourself. Uh, it, the algorithm loves uh, loves it when you make comments, and it helps other people who who may not know about this this uh, this project yet. Um, it puts it further up in into their into their stream and helps other people to find it. So. Um, make comments, ask questions. That's uh, as we're going throughout this show, feel free to make comments or ask, ask questions because at the end, I am gonna take at least a few minutes and uh, try and answer any questions that you may have. And so uh, I would invite you to, to do that as well. Um, one thing that I did last week, uh, as I mentioned that we have some big announcements and some big uh, things that I kind of teased last week. One thing that I did was that uh, we showed a little, um, we tried some subliminal advertising, <laughs> I guess, if you will. I couldn't tell you who we've partnered with, um, this incredible new, uh, new partners that are gonna be part of our team and uh, help us to get this project made. Um, and uh, we did some subliminal advertising. We showed just about one frame of a photo of, of who these new partners are going to be. And um, Ryan, do you want to just show that clip from last week and so people can see if they can figure it out? Um, I, they won't let me say what it is yet, um, but I will say this. If you believe in subliminal advertising, you may be able to figure out or get a little hint as to, um, as to what uh, we're going to be announcing this, this next week. And, and, and that's all I'm going to be able to say. But, if there is, you know, if there's anything to this whole subliminal advertising thing, you might be able to guess something. Uh, okay, did you see the flash? <laughs> did anybody figure out what that was? I know some people were going back and trying to freeze frame it on that uh, on that one frame to try and catch it. Catch it. Uh, my wife was able to do it. I wasn't. Um, maybe Ryan, we can just let's just show people. Let's give them one second to. Uh, okay. Well, you may or may not have been able to figure it out from there. Um, I'll quit uh, toying around with this and, um, and let you uh, uh, see. We, we had a chance to um, get a little message from, uh, from these folks that we're going to be partnering with. Uh, Ryan, cue it. Oh, yeah. I'm Jeff. 
John Schmidt. Steven Sharp Nelson, we're the Piano Guys, and we are so excited to announce that we're teaming up with the TV series Truth and Conviction in order to bring to life a story that needs to be told. Tell them about this Absolutely. story. Absolutely. This is a story of a German teenager named Helmut Hübner mm. who stood up to Hitler in World War II, and I have a family connection. My mom was his friend way back in 1941. This is a heroic story, right? And, and Absolutely. Even, and, more than that, and these are the kind of stories that need to be told, that our kids need to inspire them. This is the role model that, that they need to, to know that they can stand up for things too, right? Absolutely. And become the best that they could be. So I love that we're dads, so we love finding stories like this. And we've never really done something like this before, teaming up with a project like this. Because we, we believe in it. Yeah, we were compelled to. This, this is a story that needs way more than 90 minutes. And I'm so glad that it's going to be a mini series. And yeah. it's the same people that did The Chosen. Team members that have done John Adams, Stranger Things. Now, here's the cool part, though. Just like The Chosen, you can be a part of this. You can express interest in investing in this project by going to angel.com slash truth. If they open a funding round, you can be a part of this incredible show. And get part of the equity That's as well. Right. We're gonna do a live stream on October 19th with the Truth and Conviction peeps. That's right, we'll see you there. In the meantime, we gotta get back to practicing. That's right. Yeah. That's better, yeah. Ooh, yeah. Uh -huh. <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs>well there it is <laughs> yeah we uh, have partnered with uh, the piano guys with uh, with John Schmidt and and Steven Nelson and I can't tell you how stoked I am about that obviously so we shot that this just this past weekend with them and it was so much fun those guys are just so great to hang out with and um, and I love that the the energy that they bring to everything that they do um, including to this story. There's a real, as John mentioned there, it's so cool that his mom was friends with Helmut and Karl and Rudy in Germany, in Nazi Germany, that she grew up, was part of the same little faith congregation. They all went to church together, saw each other every Sunday. Um, and, uh, and actually, you see that three shot there. The boy on the left is Rudy, that's Rudy Voba, Rudy Voba and John Schmidt's mother were boyfriend and girlfriend when they were just young teenagers. <laughs> uh, before Rudy was even involved in this, that's him there as well, just when he was about 15 years old. Um, and, uh, and they were boyfriend and girlfriend. And in fact, his, he carried a photo of John Schmidt's mother with him when he was a prisoner. For, and he carried it with him for all those years. Um, it was, it was uh, really a, a, a source of hope, something for him to, to hopefully look forward to. And, and so to have that kind of a connection, I tell you, for me, it was really a dream come true when we reached out to them to see if they would be even interested in, in, uh, in teaming up with us. And when they came back so excited to say, yes, we are in, um, you know, it was just, I was just so, so grateful. So um, as they mentioned there in that little spot, uh, next Wednesday evening is for our, our live stream next week, um, they're going to be in studio with us. And we're going to dive further into, into John's connection to it. We've got some really cool things that happened between his mother um, and the and these boys and how that carried down to John's love for p playing the piano. It's just amazing. So and all of you uh, piano guys fans who tuned in and for the first few minutes were wondering, wait a minute, why why am I watching this? Okay, now you know why. And um, and we're so grateful to have you here as well. And um, and and are grateful to be able to share this story with you. So I hope everybody is ready to tune in next Wednesday for our live stream uh, with, the, with the piano guys. Um, there's gonna be some, some really cool stuff. And I would just say for you piano guys fans and for everybody, but specifically you, you piano guys fans, um, I'd love it if some of you might comment below about how you would like to see them involved in this project. If you've got some ideas and think, oh man, that would be great, they could do this or they could do that. Put, it, put comments below because uh, we've already started, you know, talking about a lot of ideas and some things that, that they could do um, to further their involvement in this project, but we would love to get some ideas from you. So, um, again, just 
so excited. I think it's the it's the it's a perfect uh, team uh, to be working with them. All right, um, going to jump into into something else that uh, that means a lot to me, and and we'll see how well I do at getting through this. Um, there's some things that I feel very deeply about, and and we're going to announce a new initiative tonight, and it's something that. Uh, that go, goes way back for me. So um, let me just start by saying this. Um, I, for as long as I can remember, I felt like there was this deep human connection between uh, when people hear stories of someone who, who sacrifices their life for someone else. There seems to be this connection across humanity with stories like that that reach deep into our hearts. And um, I've always just kind of wondered why, but I, but I knew that we all, we all do feel that connection. And, you know, when I heard the story of, of Helmut Hubener and his willingness to sacrifice his life to stand up for truth and freedom, um, to save the lives of his, of his two friends, um, I was just so taken by that. And, and I, at one point I was asking myself, why does this story touch me so deeply? And I think that there are a couple reasons. Um, one of them, I think, is is as a, as a Christian, um, as a as a lover of Jesus Christ, and knowing the great sacrifice that He made. Um, I think that when there are echoes of that in our own lives here in our own world and people when we hear of someone else who sacrificed their life. I think that's one reason that it resonates so deeply with me and, and so many of us. But on a much, in a much more specific way, there was an experience that I had. Oh, man, I was 14, I think. This was back in 1982. And in January of 1982, I remember I was watching the news and, and they showed um, there was a an airplane, it was a passenger airplane, it was Air Florida Flight 90, and it crashed into the Potomac uh, just outside of Washington, D.C. And, um, and I remember watching that, that you know, there were the, the tail of the plane, and you can see it there in that photo, just right after it happened, the tail of the plane was the only thing sticking out of the water and out of the ice. Um, the, the river was frozen. Again, this was January in Washington, D.C. The river was frozen. It crashed through the ice, and they're on the tail, and there were about six passengers who had survived and were clinging to this tail and trying to hold on in that freezing weather, and uh, people were trying to save them. So you can see there a helicopter, a rescue helicopter, came down and around and, and was dropping down lifelines to these people and in their frozen numbness, they were trying to grab a hold of it, and then it would pick them up. Uh, and at one point, you see, it even had to get down so low that the one of the rescuers on the helicopter could reach and grab someone who was too frozen to be able to, to hold on to it. But one of the parts that really, that I'll never forget, was that as the helicopter was coming out and would drop down that lifeline, there was one of the six passengers clinging to the tail of that plane who would grab that lifeline and then he would pass it to another person and make sure that they had it, that they were secure, and then the helicopter would take them away. And then the helicopter would come back and he would grab it again and pass it to another person, make sure that they got it, and, that, and then they would go away. Well, um, when the helicopter came back one more time for that man, um, he had slipped beneath the ice and water and, and drowned. And, for a few days, nobody knew who that man was. They were still trying to determine who that man was. And so the articles in the paper and on the news just kept referring to him as the man in the water. And um, I can still remember that grainy f news footage just burning into my heart of watching that man pass the lifeline from one person to the next to the next. And he must have known at some point, even in the cold and all that, at some point he must have known that if he kept passing that line to someone else, that he wouldn't be able to hold on and make it himself. But he did it anyway. And it was after years later when I was asking myself, 
why does this story of Helmut Hubner mean so much to me? Why is it so deep in my heart? And I remembered that experience of seeing the Air Florida Flight 90 and that man in the water um, and what he had done. And I realized that Helmut Hubner, he discovered something. He discovered the truth. He discovered something that needed to be shared with others. And his lifeline to others was sharing the truth. And so he was handing that out. And at some point, even though he was 16 years old, at some point he must have known that things would not end well for him if he kept doing this. But he did it anyway and was eventually caught, arrested, and, and executed for it. So this, this idea of, of lifeliners has what's been so much in my mind. And so I, I want to, and here's something that I've realized is, is that these people that I call lifeliners, like these are two very powerful examples, the man in the water, um, Helmut Hubener, um, and I think all of us can think of someone, we may not know them personally, and sometimes it is, it's family members that we know, whether they're serving in the military or, or something like that, that they are lifeliners, that they are the ones that are putting the health and safety and lives of others before their own. Um, and I've just realized that these people are all around us. And sometimes it's not in ways that are, are so, um, you know, quite so, so extreme, for lack of a better word, as with the man in the water or with Helmut Hubner that, and that kind of a thing. Um, lifeliners can be someone who just reaches out and makes a difference in our life, who's there for us when we, when we need them. And so I'm announcing tonight um, the beginning of the Lifeliner Initiative for truth and conviction. And what this is, is this is an opportunity for all of you, uh, all of us, to nominate someone that, it may be someone you know, it may be someone in your family, it may be someone that you, a story that you've heard about of someone else that you don't know personally, but to you, uh, they are a lifeliner. And, and we want you to send in to, to shoot a little video of yourself just on your phone, something very easy, and, um, and to submit um, your nominations for, for someone who is a lifeliner. And uh, we've, we've already actually got several submissions that have come in. This is something that I've kind of been spreading the word about, but not, not officially until tonight. Um, but we already have a number of submissions that have come in of people who are nominating somebody that, that they know who is, who is a lifeliner. And, um, and I wanted to just show you a couple of them, just so you kind of have a sense for, um, for, for what we're talking about, about here. Ryan, do you mind just showing that first little Lifeliner clip? I'd like to nominate a Lifeliner. Um, when I think about what a Lifeliner is, particularly in this idea uh, of Helmut Humiter's story, I think of someone who looks outside of themselves, who cares more about what is happening to the people within their sphere than they do about themselves. Um, and so I'd like to nominate my friend Cassie. Uh, I've known Cassie since I was six. Uh, we lived together in our 20s. And, uh, and when I lived in California, she lived about three hours away. And consistently at all these different stages in our life, uh, she has had this remarkable focus on serving others and on and she's always been so in touch with with what people are feeling or needing at a moment um i i actually started to notice in my early 20s whenever we would talk the way she concluded the conversation is is there anything i can do for you and i was always really bad at answering that question because you know the first answer is like no i'm fine and then um and then I started to realize the profundity of that. It was like, she meant it. She meant, like, what can I do to you? I will do it. When we lived three hours away to, from each other in California, she would, without me seeking it out, find ways for us to see each other. And each time she gave so much of herself in, in uh, 
even in those meetups of I would have to I would find out later that she'd be going through some pretty radical things and instead she wanted to make sure that I was happy um she inspires me to be a better friend not just to her but for anybody around me and to genuinely ask the question of what can I do for you so yeah Cassie's my lifeliner I love that um grateful to the person who submitted that. That's, that's such a cool example of a lifeliner. And again, not something as, as extreme as, as somebody, you know, um, handing a lifeline in, in a frozen river, but it's a friend who continued to ask, is there anything that I can do for you? And meant it. Uh, and for this young lady who sent that in, it meant a lot to her. And that's why she considers Cassie to be her lifeliner. Um, really cool. I'm, I'm, I'm going to show you another quick one, but I, I, Esther just brought me a, a list of names of people who, while we've been talking, have been uh, expressing interest in, um, uh, in the Truth and Conviction series. And, and I know for those of you who are new, I, I don't think that I explained this clearly, but if you go to angel.com slash truth, um, and that will take you to our, to our website. And that's where you have the opportunity to uh, express interest in this project. You know, our hope is that we will be uh, in in the coming days opening up a um, opening opening it up for for investors um, uh, for everybody who wants to to invest in it. At this stage, we're still gauging interest, and so that's where you can go angel.com/truth to express interest, and um, and then once uh, you know if we are able to open it up to an investment, then. All of those of you who have expressed interest will be the first ones to know, uh, including these wonderful folks. And here's just a small list of some folks who have just expressed interest tonight. We have Nicole B. from Idaho, expressed interest at $300. Um, we've got Anonymous from Arizona. i got to meet her. She seems, she seems great. Anonymous is just all over the place. But she expressed interest at $100. We have Arajit S. from Minnesota at $50. Christian R. Uh, at $75. Madeline S. from Wisconsin at uh, $150. Thank you, Madeline. Um, Anonymous again. There she is for $500. Natalie H. from Utah for $150. And Anonymous, she gets around. Boy, she's in Montana for $150. So again, thank you to all of you who expressed have expressed interest tonight. There's been such a huge upsurge of, of, of interest that's been expressed over the last week or so. It's just uh, really amazing. Okay, um, I do want to show you just one other example. Somebody else submitted a, a Lifeliner nomination that I wanted to, to show you, just a, a brief little uh, example of, of what, what these things can be. So, Ryan, do you mind playing this next one? I'd like to nominate a Lifeliner. When I think of a lifeliner as someone who is brave and does the difficult thing, building relationships and executing with courage, I think of my friend Renee, who made a huge difference in my life. Uh, when I was in college, I was unapproachable and not very friendly. And Renee was authentically friendly and she chose to be, uh, to take a risk and build a friendship with me this unapproachable, unfriendly person. And uh, she crossed the divide between my unapproachableness and made space to discuss deep topics like God, forgiveness, hope, and heaven. And although I believed there was a God, it wasn't until I had conversations with my friend Renee, who chose to take a risk by fostering this friendship that I was able, that I was really fundamentally changed. I describe it as going from grayscale to color. And from those college days, I have experienced a rich relationship with God. I know that I am forgiven. I live life with integrity and purpose, and I have a hope, all because of my brave, kind friend, Renee, who chose to make a difference in someone else's life outside of her own, took the energy to befriend an unapproachable and not very friendly college dorm friend and uh, did what she felt was the right thing to do. Another really cool, um, some, you might say simple example, but of course, for that woman who shared that Lifeliner nomination, 
uh, it wasn't simple to her. It, me- it meant a lot that, that she had a friend that changed the rest of her life, that reached out to her when she may not have seemed very friendly or welcoming. And, uh, and her friend Renee just worked past that and became a lifeliner for her. And, of course, I'm going to just share, if I can, heck, I'm the only one here, so I can, I guess, do what I want. So I'm going to share my own lifeliner. Um, you've, if you've been tuning into these at all, you've heard me talk about my dad, who was uh, uh, in World War II, who was a B-24 bomber pilot. At the age of 20, he was leading a crew of 10 men uh, flying over Europe and part of that generation who saved the world. And um, and just uh, you know got the distinguished flying cross and and the red heart or excuse me and earned a purple heart because he was injured and um, and just came back you know a hero, but like so many of his generation, um, he came back and he really didn't talk about it much. He just got on with his life. Uh, he got married and he had a big family. Um, my wife and I are very grateful that. My parents didn't stop at, at six children since I'm number seven. So we're grateful for that. But he he uh, just went on with his life and quietly doing what he could to provide for his family. And he had a couple of, of business successes that became business failures and eventually became a high school math and chemistry teacher. And you know what? He, uh, he didn't love it, to be quite honest. Um, Especially after a while, he felt like he was t- doing more babysitting than teaching. And, uh, but he nevertheless, for about 25 years, went to a job that he didn't really enjoy every single day because he had a family to take care of and a family to provide for. And so all of these students who, I'm sure a lot of them just didn't care about old Mr. Whitaker and, and, uh, and didn't know that he was part of the reason that they were free. And so I want to nominate my dad, Reed Whitaker, as a lifeliner because he did the hard things that had to be done um, without expecting praise or, or, or anything like that. And he just did it because he loved his wife and he loved his children. So nominating my, my hero, uh, my dad, Reed Whitaker, as a lifeliner. So again, that's uh, I want I would love it if if as many as you who can and who want to think of somebody that you want to nominate, and then like you saw in those examples, shoot a video of it, and then post it to your socials, post it to Facebook or Instagram, and then I want to get make sure I get this right um, that you're going to want to uh, tag truth and conviction, and that's truth ampersand conviction. Um, and then uh, hashtag lifeliner. So that would be one word to just, um, so tag truth and conviction. You can see that there. And then hashtag lifeliner um, when you post those. And then we'll get them. And then what we're going to do is, is start uh, collecting all of these and creating this mosaic of lifeliner stories that, uh, that other people can go and access and see and be reminded that they are all around us all the time. Um, normal people who are reaching out and saving the lives and saving, um, saving others all around them. So um, if you will, um, I would encourage you to, to start sending in your Lifeliner stories. And, and as you do that, we're going to, in... In, in the next couple of weeks, it'll actually be in early November, um, with all of those that we've got, we're going to, to um, recognize a few of them and play some of them and um, give some little gifts to those that we're able to choose and just start, like I said, creating this huge mosaic of stories of lifeliners. So I invite you to join the Lifeliner Initiative for Truth and Conviction and um, and submit them as you uh, start as soon as you can. Um, and the final day for this first round, will, will, I think it's going to end on November 2nd. Um, and then from there, we will, in, in a live stream soon thereafter, we'll feature some of them, um, but also give folks the opportunity to see as, as many as they can. And again, all of this tying back to 
this 16-year-old kid, Helmut Hubner, who extended a lifeline to those around him. And again, for him, that lifeline was words of truth. And, uh, and he wanted to, to try and, and share that with as many people as he could. So uh, thank you for hearing me out on that. Again, I hope everybody has a chance to um, submit that, or at least start thinking about it. Start thinking about who in your life or who's somebody that you know that, that you would consider a lifeliner. Okay, um, just a, a couple quick uh, wrap-ups. Again, uh, tune in next week for sure on, uh, on the 19th. Uh, for the Lives for Our Truth and Conviction live stream where we'll have uh, the piano guys with us. There's going to be some cool music. There's going to be some really cool stuff uh, that you won't want to miss. Um, and also another huge announcement that, uh, that they don't want me to... Oh, hello, Esther. Thank you. Okay, cool. We got some more. I'm going to read these off in just a second. But um, yeah, so another huge announcement, probably one of our biggest uh, next week with the piano guys. Um, so... Please uh, mark that in your calendars on the 19th um, next Wednesday to, to tune in for that. And had some more people. We had Andrew B. in Nevada who expressed interest at $200. Ashley in Oklahoma at $50. Bob in New Jersey at $150. Scott in Utah at $150. Man, uh, just love that. So cool. This, this is how it works. This is how it happens is that thousands and thousands of people Instead of uh, a few really, really wealthy people, you know, paying for a movie or instead of a huge uh, studio in Hollywood paying for a movie, it's power to the people, man. <laughs> it's thousands and thousands of people just like you who say, you know what, uh, I don't have millions, but I do have a thousand that I can invest in this or that I can, and so uh, that I can express interest. And if this becomes an investment, man, I'm going to do it. Or I do have $100. I can do that. So this is how it happens. This is how it works. This is how The Chosen was made. Um, this is how that uh, truth and conviction is going to get made. And so thanks to everybody for, for doing that. Uh, again, to do that, there it is on the screen, angel.com slash truth. Uh, go over there. And, and that's a place where you can not only you can express interest uh, if you feel so inclined, but it's also a place where you can find out a lot more about the project. There's a really cool um, video that you'll get to see there and just uh, get a lot more information about what truth and conviction is, its history, what it's going to be um, when it comes out as a, a four-part limited series. Um, okay. I think, unless Ryan tells me otherwise, that we've got a few minutes for um, some questions. If there have been any questions or comments, we do. you do have some. Okay. Oh, there we are on the screen. And so, okay. Let me... Could the piano guys make music for videos with behind-the-scenes footage? Add some of the music for the show. Okay, Andrea Newell, thank you for that. I think that's a really cool idea. So that's one. We're going to note it down. That's one of those things. It's like, let's see if we can work that out and, uh, and, have, them, and have them do that. Love that. Thank you, Andrea. Let's see. We got any other, uh, any other comments or questions? This is from Ben Nichols. Matt, do you feel like this story just happened to fall into place? Or do you feel something about your history has prepared you for this? <laughs> is this a job or a calling? Well, Ben, thank you for that. Um, yeah, I guess I feel it's it's a calling. <laughs> At some point, I might get paid for this, and then I guess it could be a job. But this is um, telling this story uh, is deep in my heart and deep in my soul, and has been for over twenty years. Uh, from the day that I met the last surviving member of the Helmut Hubner Resistance Group, his best friend, Karl Heinz Schnibbe, who, when he, was seven, when he was 17, was sneaking out onto the streets and taking his life in his hands and, and putting out the truth on these flyers that his friend had written. I met him when he was in his late 70s. And the story that he told me and the friendship that we were able to build um, has changed my life. And, and those three boys that you're seeing there Starting on the left, Rudy Voba, Helmut Hubner, and Karl Heinz Schnibbe. Um, they're lifeliners. They're heroes to me, but they were also real people. 
and um, and Carl was a real friend to me, and so I feel compelled, and yes, um, called to uh, to make sure and, and share this story. Uh, one of the things that uh, has been on my mind a lot lately is that after Helmut was sentenced to death, and his friends were sentenced to years in hard labor, and they're in that high court in the highest court in Nazi Germany in Berlin. And they were taken from that room. And for a few minutes, they were put together in a little cell. And Helmut was, had his hands cuffed behind his back. And Carl and Rudy were not cuffed. And so they, the guards brought in a little scrap of some scraps of bread and, uh, and a cup of water. And Carl and Rudy saw that Helmut couldn't because he was cuffed, handcuffed. And so they fed him the bread and they held the cup to his lips and, uh, and gave him the water. And, and then he said his final words to them and expressed to them what, what Rudy recorded is that his last words to his two best friends were, remember me. And they, those two friends, Rudy and Carl, spent the rest of their lives trying to honor Helmut's last words and his last wish to tell his story, to get it out there. Um, Carl was so kind to share his story with me, and I'm trying in my little way to remember Helmut, to remember what they did, and this story is, is a part of it. So Ben, thank you for that heartfelt question. And um, as you can tell, you kind of touched a, <laughs> touched a nerve or, or, or touched a, a very tender place in my heart in regards to that. Thank you. Um, is this your first series, Matt, um, from Bastille? Um, thank you, Bastille. Good, that's a really good question. This is my first uh, what they call narrative series. So I've done a number of, of uh, series, like documentary series for PBS over the years. Um, you know, 13 episode series and, and uh, 10 episode series and those kinds of things. But um, this will be the first um, narrative series, meaning um, with actors, uh, you know, a scripted um, narrative or, or not fictionalized, but, um, but uh, a, uh, you know, a scripted performance and with bringing in, bringing in actors and all that kind of a thing. So a dramatic version of this. This will be the first series. I've been directing um, actors and, and doing other narrative films for many, many years. Um, but this will be the first series of this kind that, um, that I've done. And I'm very, very excited, very excited to dive in and do it. Let's see. Uh, given how long you have carried this passion to share this story, I wonder about the impact of the story on your loved ones. Oh, man, you guys are getting me tonight. <clears throat> how do your family and friends feel about what you are doing? <sighs> yeah. Um, 20 years ago, I knew I was going to make this into a movie, and... Um, we made it into a documentary for PBS, and I was thinking at first that that was going to be it. We would just make this documentary, and then we'd be done with it, and I'd go on to other things, and it would not let go of me. And so I started writing a script to turn it into a feature film, a theatrically, re theatrically released feature film that people could, could go out and see, a two-hour movie. And my good friend and co-writer, Ethan Vincent, dove in with me, and we started writing it together. Um, 17 years ago, I talked to my wife and said, I feel called <laughs> to make this movie. And, um, and I, I remember warning her, I said, you know, this, we, this could take a couple years. <laughs> well, 17 years later, we're finally on the cusp of it. But my amazing wife and my three incredible children and extended family, my siblings, my mother-in-law, Nalisa Farrell, um, her sister, Claire, <laughs> have been so supportive, so incredibly supportive throughout all of this. Um, but I have to give um, a special shout out to my wife who over the years, whenever, when I was ready to give up time after time after time, when I'd been beaten down, <laughs> uh, curled up in fetal position, if you will, <laughs> wondering what, what the heck am I doing? 
um, she was the one that was asking that question. We're still making your movie, right? We're still going to make your movie. And so um, that kind of support has been, well, it wouldn't be happening. I wouldn't be sitting here um, talking to you tonight about the fact that we're this close to being able to make this series if it hadn't been for her and for my children and for incredible friends and family members. And I need to add also under this, um, 17 years ago as well, I reached out to a filmmaking partner of mine who had was just brilliant, a guy named Russ Kendall. And, uh, and he, his company at Kaleidoscope with Russ Kendall and Mike and Merrill and Adam Andereg and John Foss. And they said, we're in too, and man, have they been. So um, without all of that, you know, I'm, I'm the person tonight sitting in front of the camera, but there's this, this team um, of, of work and support and, and a creative, hard, hard work of pushing and, and moving. And now that we've partnered with Angel Studios, it's like all the doors are finally opening. Um, that now there's this way that we can reach out to you and, and say, help us, help us make this. If, if this is a story that you look at and think, you know what, I, I want to see this made. You know, how many times do we hear that? You know, you hear a story and you, and, and you hear people say, man, somebody should make a movie about that. That's what truth and conviction is. It's one of those stories. And so if you're watching this and thinking, yeah, you know what? I want to do my part. I want to express interest. I want to let them know that, that I'm in. Go to angel.com slash truth and, um, and join the team because we really are um, excited to be moving forward. Thank you for that, Bastille. Thank you for that, that wonderful question. Um, any other, it uh, looks like we've got another question here. It says, you have probably answered this and I missed it, but how many episodes with, will this series be? I can't wait to see it. I'll bring lots of tissues. <laughs> yes, uh, Nita Nickel. Thank you, Nita. I love that. I love that comment. Uh, it's a great question. Um, and I'm going to answer it this way. As I just mentioned, for years, this was just, it was going to be a, a two-hour movie. You know, they would go to the to the theater and see. Um, and then we sat down. We started having meetings with uh, the the you know the folks here at Angel Studios. And and one of the very first things they said, they said, "Man, we love this story. We you know we want this to be our next big hit. We we want to do this. We think it should be a series instead of a, a you know a one-off movie." And to be honest, my initial reaction was mm, no this is this is a movie we've got a great script you know we've got we've got the producer of Schindler's List saying it's one of the best scripts he've, he's ever read um, you know I think I think we know what we're what we're doing here we kept talking in that meeting and you know what happened about 10 minutes later in my mind something clicked and I saw this all I'd, all, I'd seen it for years and years as this two-hour movie and all of a sudden I saw it as a four episode, limited series. And I saw episode one, and I saw how it ended, and I saw episode two, and this cliffhanger ending there, and episode three, and the climax leading up in, in episode four. I just kind of, as I was sitting in that meeting, just without talking about it out loud, it's like, oh, okay, they're right. We need to make this into a four-part limited series. And um, so I went home and immediately started writing what I saw. And uh, and a hundred-page script uh, became 180 pages <laughs> of of um, four in these four different episodes. And what's been so cool about it, and you can tell I get excited just talking about it, but is that now with this with this more expansive approach, we can dive into the stories more deeply. We can. I'll tell you what. We already dive into Helmut Hubner's story and his friends and everything like that. We're really diving into the Gestapo agent. Who hunted him down? There was this Gestapo agent, and this is true. This is a true part of the story. Who became obsessed with finding out who was putting out these flyers? He was absolutely convinced that it was a, a, a university professor, and so he was obsessed with finding that. But we also find out that he would do really horrible things during the day. You know, he would torture people for for information. He was hunting people down, um, but at night he would go home, and he was a husband and a father, and we have evidence that he was kind and gentle. Man, how do you reconcile that? And so these were things that we realized that we could start fleshing out and diving into 
in this four-part series, which was, has just become such so even more powerful than it was before. And so, uh, Nita, to, to, long answer to your really good question, but yes, we are we're so excited that this is now um, a four-part series where we can really tell this story and give it the um, give it the screen time and give it the depth that it deserves. Okay. Okay, we got uh, another question here. It says, uh, how, when did you meet Carl and what was your favorite experience with him? From Tyler Cannon. C Tyler, thank you. Um, so <laughs> it's kind of funny. I, I had it, I was like, I say 21 years ago, I was actually working on another different World War II documentary. And a friend of mine who was working on that with me said, hey, have you ever heard the story of Helmut Hubner? Um, and I said, no. I said, you know, he had he said uh, he was a, a teenager in Nazi Germany, ran this resistance group. And then he said, I think that there's one, one of his group is still alive, and I think he just lives about 45 minutes away from here. We should see if we can reach out to him. I said, dude, I'm in. Yeah. And so we actually just opened up the phone book. We knew his name. And so we looked him up in the phone book, found it, called him up on the phone, said, hey, would you be willing to share your story with us? And that was Carl Heinz Schnibbe. He was in his late 70s by then. There, that's me standing uh, that's, uh, with Carl in the middle and our, and our small crew, and we took him over to Germany. And we were shooting, the, shooting with him there. At the, that is the site of the, the memorial where Helmut was executed. Um, but on that day when we called him, he just said, yeah, sure, come on up. And so we went up to his home, and that was the first time that I walked into his home and sat down, and he shared his story. And I know that he had shared it many times before. He'd been trying to share that story throughout his life, but I felt like it was the first time he'd ever told it. It was so powerful. And I walked out of his home that day just knowing, man, we, we have to tell this story. And one of the greatest blessings of my life is that Carl and I, along with uh, my producing partners, Russ Kendall and John Foss, um, we were be able, to, able to become close friends with Carl and his, his dear wife, Joan, um, and, uh, and to travel back to Germany with him, to go into to places that he had lived, even into cells that he was held in as a 17-year-old, to step inside there with him and, uh, and have him reminisce or remember what had happened there. Um, so that was how I met Carl. Um, unfortunately, he passed away in 2010, um, but we have uh, picked up the flag Rudy passed away in 90, 1993. Carl passed away in 2010. And in our own humble way, we've picked up the flag and are trying to keep moving it forward to remember. Remember Helmut, remember what they did. Okay. Let's see. This says, and this is from per, uh, Perkins' Blessed Adventure, having trouble finding a place to express interest. Okay, so... Go if you go to thank you by the way uh, Perkins Blessed Adventures, um, go to angel.com/truth, and that will take you to a, a landing page, a, a website, um, and there is there there's a, a button you'll see you'll see how much interest has has been expressed uh, you know up to this point. Ryan, I don't know if if you are able to bring that up and, and show them. Okay, Ryan's going to try and bring up that page so you can see what you'll find when you go there. Um, but there's a button there that says Express Interest. And once you click on that, um, that, will, that will, there you go. You can see that's the, that's the page. Um, and you can, where are we? Wow. Oh, man, we're almost at $4.4 million in expressed interest. And you see that, that button there, the orange button that says Express Interest. If you just click on that, and it's a really simple process um, that will take you in and, and allow you to, to express interest there. So I hope, hopefully you'll be able to, to, to do that and, and get in on that um, and express interest if you'd, if you'd like to. Okay. Okay. Oh, I guess we have one more comment. And so I'll, I'll look at that. Take off my readers so I can read. At an event for students, I recognized Carl's story from his book I read growing up. Carl put his hand on my shoulder and looked me in the eyes and said, this happened. It was real. Share my story. That's from uh, from Sheely. Um, thank you so much for, for sharing that. that. That call to action that Carl made to you, uh, he made to me as well. And that's what we're trying to do. Uh, thank you so much for that, for that comment. 
<clears throat> okay, one more reminder um, about next week. Uh, we have a live stream next Wednesday, the 19th of October, um, 6 p.m. Mountain Daylight Time, and I'll let you do the math for wherever you're tuning in from, but um, it'd be great if you could tune in live. We'd love to love to have you there on the 19th, and we'll have the piano guys there with us. And of course, we're going to have a lot of fun because it's the piano guys. Uh, but we're also going to announce, we have another huge announcement that they will not let me tell you about yet, but next Wednesday is when it's going to happen. Um, and then also, again, we're heading to Germany the next week. And we'll be in Hamburg and Berlin all that week. And we'll be posting to our socials and also doing um, at least two live streams while we're there, including on the 27th, Thursday, the 27th of October. Again, that's the 80th anniversary of Helmut Hubner's execution. And we will be at the site where it happened on that day. It's going to be a powerful and probably emotional live stream. You're seeing there, that is the room where it happened. And and we will be there and uh, invite everyone to also put that on your calendars and, and, and tune in for that. And, um, and again, if you have a chance to go to angel.com slash truth and, and express interest, uh, we, would, we would love that. Um, I'm going to sign off. Thank you for tuning in. Before I, before I do, just one more quick thing. I'm going to, right after I say goodbye, we're going to show uh, a, a video. And if you, you, Many of you haven't had a chance to see it yet. I would invite you just to hang on for a few more minutes and watch this short video right after I sign off. Um, it, it, uh, it takes you a little bit further into the story, into the project, and, uh, and lets you know why we're doing what we're doing. You'll get to hear more from Karl Heinz Schnibbe in his, the interview that we did with him 21 years ago. And, um, and a lot of other really cool things. You'll get to hear from the, the Academy Award-winning producer of Schindler's List as he's talking about why he feels this story is so important. So uh, take a few minutes after I sign off and, and just watch that, if you will. And we will see you next week on the 19th with the piano guys. Um, don't miss it. Come back and uh, thank you. You've just seen the proof of concept trailer for Truth and Conviction, which will be the first dramatic series about teenage resistance fighters in Nazi Germany. It tells the true story of Helmut Hübner, who at 16 years old was willing to sacrifice his life to stand up for truth and freedom. There will be more powerful scenes to follow, but I just wanted to take a moment and invite you to join us. If you think this story should be a series, show your support. Click or visit angel.com truth and let us know. How did you first discover this story of Helmut Hübner? I heard about uh, an old man who was the last surviving member of a teenage Nazi resistance group named Karl Heinz Schnibbe. Heard that he lived less than an hour away from me. I just called him up on the phone, asked if he would be willing to share his story with me. He said, yeah, sure, come on up. So I went up to his house, <laughs> sat down with him, and let him just share what his experience was as a 17-year-old with his best friend Helmut Hübner and another friend Rudy, 15, 16, 17 years old, standing up against Hitler. And they weren't using guns or fists to do it. They were using a typewriter. I was scared. I was actually scared because we read in the newspaper every day how severely these people get punished. The Nazis, they don't want you to know the truth, you know. The truth was deadly in, in Germany. 
But I was nosy enough to want to know more. The story that Carl told me that day um, has changed the rest of my life. I walked out of his house that day just knowing we have to make this into a movie. We have to tell this story. We've had the opportunity to become really close friends with Carl uh, over the years. He would share these experiences that he had. He would often get this distant look in his eyes. You could tell he was back in those moments. But to hear this you know, 80 year old man saying, this is what we did. You know, that brings a reality to it, that it's just not just a story, but people lived this. What came out of that was, you know, this not only we have to tell this story, but feel entrusted to tell the story from Carl. The screenplay is, is incredibly powerful. Matt Whitaker and his writing partner, Ethan Vincent, have really captured this engaging character piece set within Nazi Germany. And it's, it's gained the attention of, of Hollywood uh, producers, including Jerry Mullen, who was the Academy Award winner for Schindler's List. He understands the power and the importance of telling stories from that era. It's really amazing to me to think this kid was 16. Wasn't 25, wasn't 42, he was 16 years old. It had enough to, to realize that he wasn't gonna get, he wasn't gonna give in to something that he saw was wrong. One of the most important parts of the story for me was Helmut's friendship with Zalamon Schwartz, who was Jewish. One day, Zalamon disappeared and the Gestapo arrested him, and Helmut never saw his friend again. We went to church, to our church house, and there was a sign on the door which read, Juden is der Zutritt verboten. Jews not allowed to enter. And we had one Jewish member in our branch, Solomon Schwartz. You know, and they didn't let that young man in. He stood outside the door, and when we opened up with it, opening him, he was crying, but they didn't let him in. I wonder how I would feel if somebody took my best friend away. <laughs> you know, what would I do? For Helmut, um, it was time to sit down and start typing up the truth. It wasn't too long after Helmut started typing up these leaflets and putting them out that he realized he needed help. And so he went right to his two good friends, Karl Schnibbe and Rudi Voba, and asked them to help him. Helmut said, let's make a promise. He who gets caught first takes the blame. Don't incriminate anybody. And that sounds good to me because I thought I'm cool. I was the oldest, you know. I said, they don't catch me. So I said, all right. So uh, we went that night home with uh, about uh, 15 uh, flyers and Helmut typed on it, Hitler the murderer, Hitler is the guilty one. And I put him in telephone booths, I put him in, in mailboxes. The following Sunday in church, he saw me coming and he waved at me and I waved back and he yelled to the church, they haven't arrested you yet, have they? And oh. I said, will you shut up? I was, <laughs> you know, so that was Helmut, joking, you know. They were dispersing these treasonous leaflets uh, throughout Hamburg, Germany. They put them in phone booths and mailboxes and sneak them into coat pockets at the opera, eluding the Gestapo for almost a year. <laughs> Eventually, they were caught, they went to trial. At a certain point, Helmut decided he had to stand up and he had to take the attention and focus all on himself to save his two friends. And so that's exactly what he did. He stood up, he did what was right, and he let the consequences follow. Helmut was executed for standing up for truth. Carl and Rudy spent years in prison and in hard labor. An experience I'll never forget was going with Carl back to Germany and visiting some of those places where he was held as a prisoner, as a 17-year-old. But also visiting the site where Helmut was executed. And being there with Carl um, was, was truly moving. There was a busload of teenagers that pulled up with their high school teacher. And they got out and they were looking, you know, visiting this site and he just immediately gathered all of his students around Carl and said, tell us your story. To watch Carl tell them what he had done when he was their age was so powerful. 
they were getting it. That for me was when a seed was really planted. I began to realize that this isn't just a powerful story. This is a story that changes people who hear it. Just another quick invite. If you want to see this story made into a series, click or visit angel.com slash truth to show your support. Don't worry, you're not buying or committing to anything. We just need to gauge how many of you want to be a part of bringing this story to the world. And action! We are partnering with Baltic Films in Vilnius, Lithuania to shoot Truth and Good Mixion. Uh, we produced two films with them previously, and uh, we're excited to go back and, and work with a really great production partner. They previously produced HBO's Chernobyl series, as well as HBO's John Adams miniseries and the BBC's War and Peace. Another partnership we're very excited about is with Angel Studios. They've had such incredible success with the Chosen series, and we're excited to bring this project to the global audience that they've been able to reach. Our mission is to tell stories that amplify light. And when we saw the story of truth and conviction, and what that, the creators behind that story, we realized that they were gonna be able to tell a story that has those same principles that The Chosen and any other project that amplifies light. And it's a story that needs to be told today. It's a story that matters now. Helmut had big blue eyes. I mean, really big, dark blue eyes. And I never saw Helmut emotionally, you know. He never showed his emotion when, when something happened. And when I put my arms around him, I told Helmut, I see you pretty soon. His eyes filled with tears and he said to me, I hope you have a better life and a better Germany. And then he cried. You know, we talk about stories like Helmut's story of someone sacrificing their life for someone else. I've always felt that there's like this, across humanity, it's like there's this deep connection with those kinds of stories. For me, that's what Helmut did. At some point he must have known he was gonna be sacrificing his life to do that, right. but he did it anyway. That compels me to tell this story. I personally, I'm asking you to get this made, get it out there, let the world understand what this young German kid did in 1942. Talk to your friends and tell them. Even though he died in 1942, his example of courage, of character, of commitment, we're talking about today. I love what he's about. I want to be just like him. Thanks for watching. Help us share this powerful story to honor Helmut, Carl, and Rudy, and hopefully inspire a new generation. To express your interest in this series, click now or go to angel.com truth to show your support. <laughs>